home of the Cedar Rapids Colonels in the Midwest League. But this past weekend and today, punch your ticket and welcome to the 2021 NCAA Division III Baseball Championships. We will crown a champion today for the title in 2021. It's game two of this best of three series featuring the Salisbury Seagulls taking on the St. Thomas Tommies. It's game two in the best of three. The Seagulls won game one yesterday, six to one. Hi everybody, I'm Bob Brainerd along with my partner Bill Brophy and our terrific crew here in Iowa. The Seagulls on the doorstep of winning their first ever NCAA Division III baseball championship if they can take the second game. If they do not, then we play for all the marbles later this afternoon in a game three winner takes all showdown. For the Tommies, been there, done that. They have national championships, but Bill Brophy, they would like this national championship because it's the final time they will participate in Division Three baseball. Yeah, they've had a long, successful legacy in the Minnesota Intercollegiate Athletic Conference. That conference has asked that they move on. They petitioned the W, or excuse me, the uh, St. Thomas had a petition, the NCAA, to go to Division One. The petition was granted, so this is the last Division Three event that St. Thomas will participate in. There'll be a D1 school participating in the summer league in most sports beginning in the fall. They'll play hockey in the Central Collegiate Hockey Association, the WCHA on the women's side. They'll play football in the Pioneer League. This is the swan song in D3, and they'll send Andrew Try, who pitched very well on opening day, in an effort to do it. The Tommies on the year are 37-9. and nine. Like Bob said, they've won two national championships. They got here by beating Adrian 7-5 behind Try Friday, then beat Wash U, the number one team in the land, according to the pollsters, 8-4 to in 12 innings. Or excuse me. Uh, they beat them in 12 innings, 8-7 on Saturday, 6-4 on Sunday, but fell yesterday to Salisbury, 6-1, to one, and Try will try to uh, replicate his performance from Friday when he allowed eight hits and five runs in seven and a third innings against Adrian. He walked three, struck out eight that day. And the year, his big right-hander has been real successful. After going 2-0 and last year as a senior, try is 7-4 and four with a 228 under run average and has struck out 97 in 67 innings. He's a big horse who got better as the game went on last Friday against Adrian. They will need try and they will need to get this game two victory to force that third and decisive game. The batting card for head coach Troy Brohan looks like this. As per usual, Justin Meekins leading it off the center fielder, followed by Kavi Caster, the left fielder. Scott Cameron is the designated hitter. He bats third. Steven Rice in the cleanup spot is the shortstop. Sky Rayhill bats fifth. He's at first base. Cameron Heider is the right fielder, followed by Jacob Ferentz, the catcher. Luke Waddell is the third baseman. He bats eighth. And then Cullen McAuliffe is at second base. He will bat ninth for the Seagulls. When they fly high behind their bats, they scored 11 runs in each of the three games to win Pool B in this eight-team two-pool double elimination tournament. They, they uh, well, handled everybody, but uh, are now 33-4 and four in the year. Beat Cortland 11-1 to one Friday. Wheaton 11-7 to seven on Saturday. Cortland again 11-9 to nine with four ninth inning runs on Sunday. And beat St. Thomas 6-1 yesterday. They've won 13 in a row, 19 out of 20. And they can really swing it, starting with this guy. That's your guy. That's 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 the four-letter networks guy. The guy is Justin Meekins we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, that guy. Meekins. Yeah, he was the then for years the talk on social media because because of his his look and what he does on on photo day but the bottom line this guy is a terrific baseball player fourth team all-american according to d3baseball.com 387 hitter with five homers 39 rbis he's a terrific table setter on the base paths he's a hustler he's a scrambler he plays great center field and he swings with a purpose with a vengeance it's violent 8 for 18 in the tournament. 
with four RBIs. Strike three called. Try gets the best of Meekins. One away. Here's the defense behind Try for the Tommies. Some shifting in the outfield with Wallace starting in left field, then Lehman in center, and Eldridge moving over to right as Caster steps in. We'll finish up after this pitch. On the infield, it's Halverson at third, Ink at short, Kulesa at second, and Morris at first base, and then you have Bartholomew behind the dish for the right-hander trot. I mean, Caster is one of many left-handed hitters in this lineup. He can run. Launches this one high in the sky. First base side, foul territory. Is there room? There was, but Morris ran out of room, and ball fo falls foul. A lot of foul territory here. The dugout juts out. But that's a tougher play than it looks for Morris, who had to navigate over there, and he didn't know where the wall was. Reached out, and he couldn't make the play. So Caster, 7 for 18 in the tournament, will get another swing. Get a home run, driven in six. Inside, two and one. Caster, a threat to steal when he's on the bases. On the year, he's a 367 hitter with six homers, 37 RBIs. Inside, outs that one in the left field. Deposits the baseball for a base hit. And he is a threat to steal as well, so you can keep your eye on him because the Tommy certainly will. Inside outs his ball over the head of Halverson. And now Scott Cameron. Cameron's story is worth repeating was on the bench for the Gulls most of the first half of the season. Then got a start in left field on April 23rd at St. Mary's. Never looked back. O over 16 starts since then. He hit 420, seven extra base hits, 15 RBI, and 19 runs scored. You talk about taking advantage of the door opening. That's what Cameron did. Five for 18 here with a homer and four RBIs in Cedar Rapids. Cuts through that try offering, one and two. And a long home run, towering home run the other night. Been susceptible to striking out, though. He is a free swinger. More strikeouts than anybody else in the field with seven. There's the first throw over to keep Caster in view. Almost got him. Gaster, the leader in steals, as we said, but he's been shot, caught two or three times attempting to steal a base here in Cedar Rapids. There he goes. And strike three, so. Gaster gets in there safely. Time as we're hoping for the punch him out, throw him out, but they get Cameron with the K, two away. And now Steven Rice, the batter. Defensive swing by Cameron, throws late. Caster in at scoring position. Rice up the middle. Kulesa gets there, side retired. Good work by Try on the mound. Good work by Kulesa on the field. Tommy swing the sticks. Got your purple pom-poms out, St. Thomas fans. They came here early. Good bunch on hand here in Iowa to cheer on their Tommies. The guys in 
Purple need all the help they can get. Need this game two to force a game three. The batting card for head coach Chris Oline goes Kulesa to lead it off, then Lehman the center fielder. Thorpe the DH bats third. The catcher Bartholomew in the cleanup spot, followed by Halverson the third baseman. Wallace is in left field batting sixth. Then Eldridge in right field batting seventh. Ink the shortstop will bat eighth. And Morris, the first baseman, will bat ninth. Benji Thalheimer is on the hill for the Seagulls, Bill. First start of the year for the freshman. He gets the ball from Troy Brohan in the biggest game of the year so far for the Seagulls. Benji's from Columbia, Maryland, 6'1", 205. We've seen him in the tournament before, however, and pitched, he pitched awfully well, earning this start. He threw two and two-thirds innings against Cortland on Sunday night, picked up the win, didn't allow a hit or a run. And first pitch strike to Kulesa. Alheimer walked one the other night in the, that long stint. This is his seventh appearance. He's thrown but 10 and a third innings and allowed 10 hits. To center, Meekins will get there for out number one. Here is the defense for the Salisbury Seagulls. It goes Caster in left, Meekins in center, Hyder in right. Waddell, Rice, McCullough, Rahill left to right in the infield, and Farron's behind the dish for the right-hander Thalheimer. One up and one down for Avery Lehman. We told you Salisbury were a bunch of big bombers with a lot of power. St. Thomas averaged seven runs a game in winning Pool A, all three of their games. But they do it a different way. They'll get a single, steal a base, hit and run on you, old school stuff. Only you're averaging seven runs a game. That isn't bad. They got stifled yesterday by Jackson Balzen and Clayton Dwyer. Hot smash, but Waddell is right there. Two away. <laughs> Troy Brohan said in the post game after yesterday's game one victory that he went with those two pitchers because he wanted to make sure they could lock down game one if possible. Wanted to throw his best available. Balls in won his second game of the tournament with five innings of five hit work. Gave up three hits to start the game to St. Thomas and then shut him down. Dwyer, an All-American, came in four innings of relief work. Got only one hit. Josh Thorpe, first pitch, catch by Heider. Side retired, one, two, three frame for Thalheimer. No score top of two. We've rattled off all the combatants. Now we will give you the arbiters of this championship matchup. They are all over the field. We have six of them for this game two tilt. Behind home plate is Paul Thompson. First base, Kyle Reese. Mark Yoder's at second base. Jeff Merzell's at third. And then down the left field and right field lines, left field is manned by John Jackson, and right field anchored by Mike Monita. We do have video review here at the Division III World Series. Each coach can has two challenges available that they can ask for a review. The umpire and crew on the field can also initiate a review on their own. It can also be initiated from the chief upstairs, the eye in the sky, if you will. <laughs> Top of two, Sky Rahill will lead it off for Salisbury. And a first pitch from Andrew Try is a strike. Ringo's had a good tournament. Six for 19. He's driven in three runs. It's one for four yesterday. That one a little low. One and one. That work was done against two pitchers. Drew Colburn went the first four and two thirds. Gave up ten hits. Jeremy Click came out of the bullpen and gave up just one run. But basically St. Thomas should have Except for those two guys, all hands on deck for the final day of the season. Graham Wabshops, their second team All American pitcher. You would think the left hander would go if there is a game three. And who knows, to be quite honest, 
for the Seagulls. Yeah. Again, they used their two studs yesterday. But Malzan, who's 2-0 and in this tournament. Dwyer, again, an All-American. 10-0. But he was awfully good. Got the save yesterday. And, again, because it's the last day of the season, you would think he might try to pitch again. But you never know. Coach does. And. Troy Brohan in his seventh season knows his people. He's an old pitcher, pitching the big leagues, won a World Series with the Arizona Diamondbacks. Both these coaches are old pitchers. Brohan played in the big leagues with the Giants, as well as the Dodgers, came out of the University of Nebraska, got drafted by the Giants. That's a base hit for Ray Hill. Leadoff man aboard here in the second for the goals. And here is Cameron Heider, the right fielder. Another left-handed hitter. Let's see if Heider's bunting here. The goals want to play with the lead. As we get to the bottom of their order. Drops it down. That's a beauty. Now Overson makes the play. Heider made it close at first. We've seen Halverson make that play constantly. It's a tough play. You see it in big league games. You kind of take it for granted. The college game, Halverson's done about as well as you can. And he, he gets the out at first. So now here's the catcher. Jacob Ferens, yesterday, game one. Ferens, goodbye. Cleared the fence Two run in left homer field. Gave his team the lead to race the one nothing lead. St. Thomas put up in the first inning. Ferens got that in the second inning. He said afterwards in, in the post-game presser that he saw the curveball earlier. And so that was to his liking. It was meaty enough that if he got it again, that we'd be able to pounce on it, and did he ever? Turned six for 16 in the tournament, two homers, four RBIs. 1 0. Bartholomew struck the pose there, didn't get the call. 2 0. On the year, Ferentz hitting 366 with four homers, 19 RBIs. He also had a defensive gem the other night against Cortland. Got a piece of that. Yeah, Brohan said that he used the word carefree about going all in to win game one so they could Play game two today carefree, and then he quickly kind of revisited that. So it doesn't mean we're not going to try to win, it doesn't mean we're not going to go all out, but it just loosens you up. It doesn't put the pressure on you to show up the next day, which is today. And guys squeeze a little harder, they, they tense up, some of them do, and so he did all he could to try to get that game one to be a little more relaxed today. Ooh, Ferens got hit in the helmet. That's why that flap is there. Troy Rohan coming out to check on his catcher goes down to one knee. That isn't a good sign. Ferens is Sophomore from Mount Airy, Maryland. At the Lingdenor High School. Another member of the athletic training staff coming out to check on Ferentz. I and mean, certainly a hush has fallen over perfect game field. Some concern for the Seagulls catcher. Sure, if there's a laceration on his face or. Yeah, 
the home plate umpire, he signaled immediately and then said, got him on the, the helmet. So hopefully most of the baseball clipped that f helmet flap and didn't get any of Ferens in the face. We'll be runners at first and second and one out when we resume. With Luke Waddell, who's been a hot hitter in this tournament coming up, followed by Cullen McAuliffe, who's been even a hotter hitter, both hitting over 500 in the tournament. But the concern right now rests with clearance. Jacob still being tended to by one of the trainers. Obviously, he wants to stay in. Yeah, we've seen this kid play, and behind the dish goes all out. He's a gamer. And they're giving him every opportunity to stay in. I think it hit the ball hit him in the nose. Looks judging by the shot we had, uh, what seemed to be working on. Sometimes a baseball will hit a player in the helmet, and the helmet, the kickback, will cut a player, and it'll. But as you said, they're giving him a moment, and. Yeah, it looks like they're working on the nose. <laughs> Meanwhile, everybody is standing around, including Try. I'm surprised he doesn't throw to one of his infielders to stay loose. It's a warm, muggy day here, the warmest or the muggiest day we have seen since we've been to Cedar Rapids. Again, it is almost ideal to play in. And Ferens to his feet. Yeah, the nose, you can see a lot of swelling there. But a smile, that's good. Now Coach Brohan asking him, he can go. I think Coach Brohan now asking the trainer if Barons can play. He's in. I guess that's the answer. That's a pretty good sprint. Says it all. Let's play, boys. So two on, one out. And this is Luke Waddell, another left-handed hitter. Eight for 17 in the tournament with six RBIs out of the number eight spot in the order. Ferens will have a... He'll have a battle wound and a story to tell from the World well, Series. Well, we're not done yet. He's, here comes the trainer out again. I think he's got blood on his hand. You've got to address that. <laughs> Maybe put something on his nose. If you've ever broken your nose, <laughs> you know how painful that can be. Yeah. Again, Ferens is a catcher with potentially 17 more innings ahead of him today. And I think they'll be watching him closely to, to see how Jacob does. I mean, that sprint down to first was encouraging, and let's hope uh, a sign of he's okay. <laughs> but, yeah, there's blood spattered after the hit by pitch, so they're taking care of the blood on his uniform and his wrist and hand. And Here's some of the Seagull faithful. Bob was not commuting with them this morning. Well, you know what I did? Because I started off the tournament pronouncing it Salisbury. I thought enunciating was the proper method. And it's been method. pointed out the error of your ways. Yeah, and rightfully so. And, and 
appreciative that we got it right. So I went right to the source this morning and asked, okay, tie break. You people have sons there. What is it? Is it Salisbury? Is it Salisbury? It's definitely not Salisbury. And they said, no, no, sir. It is Salisbury. So you don't enunciate it. And it's not Salisbury. Salisbury is the proper way that they say it. As a longtime admirer of Salisbury steaks, I knew right <laughs> from the start yeah. of the tournament. You had no issue. Yep. <laughs> Salisbury's seagulls out of Salisbury, Maryland, on the eastern shore of Maryland. Roman 8748, established in 1925. And the seagulls and their fans are trying to win, or watching their team try to win their first ever national championship today. Well, and this year they're trying to piggyback off of the Seagulls women's lacrosse team. They won the Division Three national championship back in May, and they went unbeaten on the season. That's something, a perfect season in lacrosse. The cleanup of Ferentz has been accomplished. It took a team of many, right? It did. It takes a village. Okay, he's set, we're set. First and second with one out, and again, here's Luke Waddell. Waddell's a junior from Centerville, Maryland. He and McAuliffe, the number nine hitter, are the two top hitters average-wise in the Seagulls lineup in this tournament. Inside, but a strike, 0-1. Both have had collected eight hits. That's second most in the tournament. Well, Meekins also has eight. Try to the plate. Strike two. Caleb Durbin of Wash U had ten hits in fewer games than these fellas, but Wash U's back home watching. But Durbin had a big tournament offensively with two homers, eight RBIs among his ten hits. Try looking to get an out here. One and two. Outfield shallow for Waddell in left and center. Eldridge giving him a little room and right. <laughs> Two aboard, one down for the Golds. Strike three. Try takes care of Waddell on his own. Two away. Third strikeout for the big right-hander. His second caught looking. Good pitch. Now the number nine hitter, Colin McCullough. And McCullough, eight for 14. That's 571. Got a homer and four RBIs out of this nine hole in the order. Strike one. On the year, McCollum's a 333 hitter with two homers, 19 knocked in. He's a senior from Annapolis, Maryland. Goes down and tried to get it. 0 and 2 to McCollum. Cullen has performed here. He's been like a second leadoff hitter for Coach Brohan. And then the big boys, Meek and Caster and Cameron and Rice can come up. And McCollum's been on base a lot. Try would like to keep him off the base here. And go after it, one and two. And off speed with the breaking pitch at 68 miles an hour. Runners with their leads at first and second. The one, two, inside. Tried to get hit by that pitch. 
Yeah, didn't even flinch. Mikhailov comes in. Yeah, I think he tried to get his thigh or hip in front of that off-speed offering again. Unsuccessful was Mikhailov, so we'll do it again at 2-2. Mm. Half the time he's infield <laughs> was in the dugout. Now it's full. Now the runners will be moving. McCullough got a piece. Bartholomew hangs on. Gold strand. Lazy, hazy summer day here in Iowa. Cedar Rapids, temperature in the high 80s. It's been perfect baseball weather. 82 right now to be exact. Supposed to be in the high 80s. We'll get there. By the time. Yeah, we will. But it has been dry when we started the tournament and now here on Championship Tuesday. Mother Nature has been kind to these baseball teams. St. Thomas needs to win to force a third game in this best of three series. If Salisbury wins, it's all over. St. Thomas here for the seventh time in the national championship. First time since 2014. They're looking for their third national title. They won crowns in 2001 and 2009 when Dennis Denning was the head coach. Chris Oline was the assistant coach. Oline has taken over and done a nice job with this program. Here's Charlie Bartholomew to lead it off. And the connection for St. Thomas with their women's program, the softball team, they made it to the D3 College World Series. Only school in Division Three that sent both the baseball and softball teams to their respective World Series. Tommy's are the last program still playing this will be it. Close out Division Three. Long run, Meekins. Instead, Caster cuts them both off. Meekins and Rice converge, and Caster says, I got, got it, guys. One away. Well, Caster called off the center fielder. It's usually the other way around, but Caster showing his good speed. Got to that ball from Bartholomew. St. Thomas has made his reputation. The identity of this team is of the comeback kids. They're 11 and 4 in the postseason with two walk-off wins, seven other comeback wins in the playoffs. But they need a comeback today from being down 0-1 in this best of three series. Is Kyle Halverson, the third baseman, got beat 6-1 yesterday, and the bats went very quiet after he got three hits to lead off the game and punched him for a run. Only got three hits the rest of the day and have yet to record a hit today against the freshman Thalheimer. Benji gets ahead. 0-2. And St. Thomas playing without their right fielder, Jake Porter, who's been one of their hotter bats here. Porter suffered a leg injury yesterday in a three-run fifth inning, which turned the game around. But he's out of the lineup today, so Josh Thorpe's been moved up to where Porter's hitting the three-hole, and Mike Wallace has been inserted into the lineup, and he'll hit after Halverson. Two, traced it in, runs the count full. Kyle's a four, uh, 232 hitter with four homers, 31 RBIs. Went 0 for 3 yesterday. But he's been hot, has 16 hits in his last 13 games. It's this one sky high in left field. Caster directs some traffic, takes it again, two away. And now the aforementioned. Mike Wallace plugged him in when Porter got hurt in right field. Defensively, he is in left field today. The 
Alexis Wallace's fifth start of the season in his sixth game of the season. He's seven for 15 with a double and two RBIs and very limited work. Do you think he gets the 60 minutes oh. reference? Or is, is well, that his generation probably doesn't know what that is, right? I was going to say we're dating ourselves. Yeah, about we are. We, we do that regularly because we're old. <laughs> Mike Wallace, this Mike Wallace went to Southwest High School in Minneapolis. There's also Mike Wallace, the Ravens receiver, former Pittsburgh Steeler. The 60 Minutes guy was a little more famous. Yeah, that even with the kids. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you live in Baltimore. And a lot of these Salisbury kids do, so or the metro area of Baltimore. 2-1 to Wallace. Off the end of the bat foul. Tommy's looking for their first hit of the morning. Still searching. Benji Thalheimer goes one, two, three, and registers his first K today. A gentle summer breeze blowing today. We've seen it blowing out of the stadium most of the days. Yeah, much more of a gentle breeze today. Not a factor at all where it has been for much of the tournament. But this weather is on the five update brought to you by our <laughs> friend Bob and Bill. <laughs> We've been pretty good about giving weather updates over the last five days. But who, you who should... takes over for us? Um, <laughs> the night crew. <laughs> Yeah, the, yeah the, the weather keeps getting updates because it's nice. It's n <laughs> we're, we're blessed that we're not talking about pending showers or thunderstorms or the tarp coming out and delays. We've yeah. had none of that. No, it's been perfect. Top of the order for Salisbury in the scoreless game as we start the third. Was Justin Meekins. He was a strikeout victim against Try in the first frame. A self-described weird guy. Embraces his weirdness, yes. But worth repeating that Justin isn't just a novelty act, you know, on the end of the Gulls bench. He's a, a key to everything they do. The Jason Worth lookalike struck out to start the game. He's been one of four strikeout victims for try. Two biggest strikeout victims were Waddell and McAuliffe. They end the second with two on and one out. Fisted there. And Halverson makes the play to retire Meekins. Bill pointed it out, and Halverson is a terrific third baseman. Anytime anybody has tried to drop down a bunt, he's been there to field it cleanly, take care of business. Good asset defensively for the Tommies. There's Caster now. Singled and stole a base in the first, but was stranded out at second base. Caster out of. South River High School from Crofton, Maryland. Missing outside 2-0 from Try. He's just a sophomore, but this is a veteran Salisbury team. And here for the first time since 2015. That was Coach uh, Troy Brohan's first season. They did a two and barbecue act that year. It didn't have much success. They've been, he's run a good program since. It's 200 wins in six years there, but they hadn't got back till this year and they have yet to lose in Cedar Rapids. Caster working the count here, three and one.
last time Salisbury lost it was the middle of May. They, they fell in 23 innings in a game that lasted over two days. Started the game one day, suspended it. They came back and played the end. Of Bob only wishes he could have broadcast that 23 inning tilt when, oh. when the Seagulls lost. Castro walks. Can't imagine. So Scott Cameron, strikeout victim in the first. And Castor, again, the team leader with 20 stolen bags. For the record, Thalheimer, who hasn't a lot of hit in two innings today, was the losing pitcher that day when Southern Virginia beat Salisbury 7-6 in 23 frames. That's three baseball games plus two innings. Or two nine-inning games plus five innings. It's too that many. I, it's too many. That's <laughs> that Oshkosh education working out. <laughs> Division three, baby. <laughs> I'm all about the Division Three <laughs> student athlete experience, <laughs> and so are you. <laughs> Bob didn't take a lot of advanced math classes at Oshkosh. Uh, how will math come into play in broadcasting? <laughs> you tell me. Again, lots of throws over. Stolen base leader, he already swiped a bag here in the first. Cut there by Cameron. Outfield, respecting Cameron's deep ball ability. Pretty much straight up, but making sure that nothing flies over their heads. A cue shot. Halverson will cut it off and make the play smoothly for out number two. Yeah, he's been good at third. Want to make sure and get one out out of that play. Caster once again is at second base with two outs. That's where he was in the first inning when Stephen Rice grounded out the second. And here is Rice. Looking to drive in the first run of the morning. Ink. I retired. Solid D as per usual by the Tommies. Eldridge, Inc., Morris, 7, 8, and 9 for St. Thomas here in the bottom of third. They haven't done much against this freshman right hander in the first two innings. hitter to kick start it here for the Tommies. Swing and a miss. Dahlheimer. Ahead 0-2. Eldridge made his first start of the season in the NCAA Regionals May 29th. He went seven for 17 in five regional starts and has carried over his hot hitting here. He's seven for 19 in the College World Series. Once he got in the lineup, he has not left the lineup. Playing left field today, or right field today. Down on strikes there. Strikeout number two. For Benji Thalheimer, one away in the third. Drop right off the table. Good pitch. Here's Matthew Ink. We 
have an eight-team tournament double elimination style, you have many heroes. Inc. was one of those heroes. On Saturday, he came up the big hit, the game winner in the 12th inning against Wash U. Sent the St. Louis team home with a tough loss that day. Inc. a redshirt freshman from Edina, Minnesota. Scooped by Ferens. Two and one. Twelve for twenty-six in the last seven games. Comebacker, but Thalheimer can't nab it. McAuliffe will try and overshoot his first baseman Ray Hill. See what they rule there, whatever it is, it will provide St. Thomas with its first base runner of this scoreless game. Ooh, what a hit. Like a good old fashioned pinball machine off yeah. the glove of Thalheimer and McAuliffe. Yeah, he might have beat it even with a good throw. Doesn't get second base. That ball didn't go into the dugout. It caromed off the railing back in play. So, Ink aboard with one down for Morris. Tommy's get off the schneid in the hit column with that Ink single. Morris. Uh Freshman from Woodbury, Minnesota, at the East Ridge High. I was a rookie of the year in the Minnesota Intercollegiate Athletic Conference. Good glove man, too, in the field. Yeah, he's looking at three errors all year. Hank Thomas prides itself on winning with pitching and defense. They play a lot of small ball. In fact, the two teams in this championship series are numbers one and two in sacrifice bunts in Division Three this season. St. Thomas had 57 and 45 games coming into this series. Salisbury, 53 and 36 games coming into this series. And that's certainly a different philosophy in how to play the game than you'll see at the major league level these days. You can win in Division Three the other way, but boy, that is that is interesting and telling. You execute, preach the fundamentals, good things will happen. There goes the runner, a little hit and run. Meekins trying to get there, can't place it on a hop. So Ink to second, Morris with the single, two aboard with one away. Chrysaline starts the runner, and Meekins did a good job of faking out Hank. And you can see he had a decent jump, but he had to wait to see if Meekins was going to get this ball, and Meekins shows his theatrical skills and fakes Hank. First and second, one out. Top of the order coming up for St. Thomas. There's Kulesa. Base hit to left. Stop sign goes up. They're loaded with Tommies. Lessa finds the hole between short and third. Caster does a nice job of quickly charging the ball. The stop sign went up at third and rightly throws. Oh, a strong throw got the ball in the infield in a hurry. So the sacks are full with one out in his third. First rally of the game for St. Thomas. Benji Thalheimer. Retired the first seven St. Thomas batters. And then the Ink pinball machine single, the Morris single, and now the Kulesa single has them loaded for Lehman. Ball one. Again, Coach Brohan aware of how St. Thomas likes to play as the first baseman, Rahel 
in an, a step on the grass, maybe two steps on the grass at first. He thinks uh, they're aware of a suicide squeeze. Yeah, he wants to pounce if it comes his way. Foul pack. The rest of the infield plant halfway. And love a double play ball. You can see Ray Hill back to nervously do some manicuring in the dirt, but he's back in the grass prior to this 1 1 pitch. Sawed him off, but it might drop. It will, and a run will score. Throw to second, not in time. Heider tried to at least get a force at second with the deke. But the Tommies still have him loaded and a run in here in the third. Good read by Kalesa on this ball. He saws him off, but he boops it into right. Right fielder comes hard, but again, this, the base runner at first, Kalesa read the play properly and beat the throw into second. So four hits in a row, played a run, give Lehman an RBI, and the bases are still loaded with D.H. Josh Thorpe coming up. So Lehman didn't hit it hard, but found some green and right. It's pretty much what St. Thomas does. Again, there's thunder in them, our Salisbury bats. We haven't seen it today, but there has been. This is what St. Thomas will do. They'll get them where they ain't, as they say. And this is the type of game they want. If they can get good innings from Andrew Try, their starter, well, nickel and dime you and dink and dunk you, and that's how they want to try to win this game and force a decisive game three later today. So still loaded here for Thorpe, the designated hitter. Flew out to right his first A.B. Thorpe had hit down in the order earlier in the tournament, but with Jake Porter out, Thorpe goes to the three hole. And again, Porter's boss is felt. He was hitting 450, is hitting 455 in this tournament, five or 11, but he's out, and Thorpe in the three hole with a chance to add to a one nothing lead. Allheimer to the plate. Strike one. Ray Hill again, the first baseman. He's on the infield grass. Thorpe four for 17 in the tournament. Gold's dugout directing traffic to the outfielders. Smash, gloved, out at second, and at first, double play. He's played by Rice. That's probably the best hit ball in the inning by St. Thomas. Rice gloved it on one hop. He's heading toward the bag anyway. Stepped on the bag and completed the inning-ending double play, which deflates the St. Thomas rally. The shutout is over, and we have our first run. Top of four, Seagulls. Back to the plate. Now trailing one to nothing. They trailed one nothing yesterday in game one when St. Thomas tallied in the first inning. After that, it was all goals. Take advantage of a bad hop single, really, it was the key play in yesterday. Parents hit the home run and make it 2 1, but. Ball took a bad hop over the first baseman Morse's head, and instead of it being the inning ending out, it turned into a two run single. 2 1 game became 4 1. Waddell followed with a hit, it became 5 1. And again, the same time, it didn't do much offensively, but that was a bad break. Yeah. I mean, it, it just was the classic of bad hop. Morse, who's only had three errors in first base all year, didn't have a chance at that one because the ball hopped over his head. Yeah, Morris was poised. Glove was out. Spread, ready. I got this. Nope. Definition of a bad hop single. Here's Sky Rahill to kickstart the fourth inning, and he's got a base hit up the gut. Second hit of the day for Rahill. Second time he's let off an inning with a hit. Cameron Hyder now. Drop down a sacrifice 
in the second inning, trying to make something happen for the Gulfs. down a run. Gohan deciding he wanted to play with four and get the lead in the second inning. Here, now that he's down, looks like he's taking the bunt off. Two and out of Cam. And they listed five, six, one fifty. Laurel, Maryland, at the reservoir high. Hill down to second. First two goals on here with nobody out for Ferens the catcher. And hit bats in the afternoon for Fry. This one will be a little easier to take for Hyder than it was with one in the, in the nose to Ferens yeah. in the second. Oh, I speak too <laughs> soon. Ferens in some pain and asking for a moment. Thank you, Dr. Brophy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's easy for me to say. <laughs> Still, he's putting that sliding pad on, but to walk it off a little, get the feeling back. That's Jacob Ferens. Squares, fouls it off. Well, I, I don't know if I could, after getting hit in the face, I could turn and square with I, only a bat there as protection. I was thinking the exact same thing. <laughs> Jacob. That, that takes some courage. He's got more guts than a lot of people. He squares again. Gets it down this time. And terrific bunt. Farron's hustling. Is out at first, but mission accomplished. And that goes back to your point. Here's a guy who's gone yard a couple times here at the College World Series. Now we need you to bunt. But both these teams do. Ferentz executes perfectly. He gets it down. Nice job by Bartholomew to bounce out and throw out the opposing catcher. So now you've got two away with one down, and Waddell. Thomas will play the infield back. He'll concede the run, and it's Waddell's job to put the ball in play. Look out. Oh, yeah, he got hit. So with one out, the bases are loaded. And Waddell tried to get out of the way. He, he's leaning over the plate and then tried to dive bomb himself. Tried to curl away, and... That one won't hurt. It'll, it'll graze the jersey. So loaded with gulls here in the fourth, and McCullough. And he's eight for 15 in the tournament with four RBIs. Price struck him out in the second. Comes in. 
McCullough does it again. Have yourself a College World Series, young man. Two hit batsmen come back there. The devil try. Good piece of hitting going up the middle, taking what they gave him, but he ties the game with his ninth hit and fifth RBI of the CWS. And now, top of the order. Meekins, Caster on deck. Cameron, this bottom's been terrific. These guys are a handful, too. Try has got Meekins twice today. Struck out in the first, grounded out in the third. Justin. Tommy's I mean, still playing the infield back now. They'd love a double play ball. Try to get out of the inning that way. As much as Thalheimer induced the double play, the quiet St. Thomas rally in the bottom of the third. Bartholomew bluffed and everybody in the neighborhood at their respective bases. Out of 3-0. This is not ideal for Andrew Try. Beacons takes. delivers. Swing and a miss. Big out there for the Tommy's hurler. Two away. Second time today. Try has got Meekins. This time he comes from 3-0 down in the count for his breaking pitch and Meekins swings over it. Now Caster. The base is loaded and two away. A strike. Kavi has Single and walked. Castro eight for 19 in the term with a homeward six RBI. To right, Eldridge has to play it on a hop. Two run score. And Castor over at first, shrugs and says, okay. Got the job done. Yes, you did. It's three to one. Well, I don't think the right fielder gets a very good jump on this ball. A nice stroke by Caster. But again, playing a new position with Porter out. He just took a bad angle to the ball. It fell in front of him. And with two outs, everybody's running. And all of a sudden, the Seagulls have a 3-1 lead. You're right, Bill. I think that's why Caster kind of shrugged when he got the first. I, think he, well, I thought, he thought the ball was going to be caught. That's what I, yeah. And again, Eldridge, who's played left field for the whole tournament and pretty much his whole college career, as he said, he didn't start a game until May 29th, playing right field with Porter out, and the ball comes at you differently. He didn't take the most direct route to that the line drive, and it fell in front of him. Cameron, backhanded by Morris, shovel to try out of the inning. But the goals erased the one nothing deficit. Tally three here in the fourth. Welcome back to Cedar Rapids. We're at Veteran Memorial Stadium. This is perfect game field. This is the home of the Cedar Rapids Colonels, the Midwest League affiliate of the Minnesota Twins. Second year, the uh, NCAA has chosen to play its national championship in Division Three. In this venue, holds 5,300 when the Colonels have a full house. They're on the road for the last five days. St. Thomas will try to come back from 3-1 down. They got the four, five, and six hitters up. Charlie Bartholomew, Kyle Halverson, and Mike Wallace to face the freshman Benji Thalheimer, who's allowed four hits over the first three innings. Thalheimer has already 
picked up a win in this tournament. He rocks and fires. 0-1. Peter Rapids has been a very gracious host to all of us here. The last five days, we talked about the perfect weather. Back here next year again, Appleton had hosted this event for the previous 19 years before the NCAA chose, or, well, they changed the format. It's one of the reasons Appleton didn't bid to continue hosting, but two years ago, the NCAA adapted the same format that are used in the Division I and II tournaments where they had a super regional round. And because of that, instead of the Division III tournament ending on Memorial Day weekend, it's been pushed back a week, and Appleton chose not to bid. Cedar Rapids stepped up. They posted and done a nice job at it. Bob Ritter making a move here. He rejoins us after Bartholomew walks to lead off the floor. Oh, we just, just comment again. What a pleasurable experience it's been here. Here in, in Cedar Rapids? Right near. Oh, you bet. We're about 20 miles from Iowa City, about 100 miles from Des Moines. It's going to be about a four-hour drive from St. Paul, where St. Thomas is located. Here's Halverson. Take strike one. Yeah, the hospitality has been great. People here, outstanding. Nice to us as you can be. You get a use of shorter games, but that has That's nothing to do with the right, people yeah. to rap. They want to go home early, too. Yeah. Salisbury, the first three games the, Se the Seagulls played here finished at 1, 2, and 1 a.m. Short, Rice will go to second for one. Relay in time for the double play. Oh, they made that look easy. And they erase Bartholomew and Halverson, two away. Second, second straight inning, the Gulls have pulled off a duller double play. Say the middle infield is working well together. So now Wallace with the bases clean here in the bottom of the fourth. Strike one. Check it. Ball one. You're not a doctor. I'm not an umpire. Two and oh. Third, Bobble, Waddell, and he'll lead the baseball. He had time. The first Bobble, he still had time to make a play, but then couldn't find the handle. I assume that'll be an error. Bullpen activity for the Gulls. That's Corey Burton. Eldridge. either partner but I can tell you this the wind is picked up it is blowing right into our faces here in the press box so it's coming in directly from center field that's different than it was a game day yeah it was a real gentle breeze so to get it out of here today you're gonna have to really muscle it One and two to Eldridge. Oh, 
to short, Rice again. Side retired. Four complete here in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Good look at this here facility. Veterans Memorial Stadium. And if we don't get a chance to do it later, we can talk about how nice we've been treated here. A lot of that has to do with Dan Hammes, the SID of the American Rivers Conference, who's the host of this tournament, along with Chuck Rivkin, their commissioner. They've, uh, they've really, uh, they and their staff have done a great job making Bob ourselves and our uh, Tupelo Honey crew feel welcome and doing all they can to make our stay as pleasant as it can be. After it just can be, when you spend 16 and 17 hours a day in the ballpark. Yeah, five days of listening to us saying, where are the lineups? Come through. Along with everything else, yeah, thank you. And we should thank Gene McGiver and the Sports Information Director at St. Thomas for providing us notes. Will DeBoer, Salisbury doing the same. They've given us lots of tidbits to help make us sound smarter than we are. Ink gobbles and throws. Retires Rice, one away. Neither Gene nor Will are here. They're summer vacation. <laughs> Come on. Been waiting. No, but the, uh, but they were awfully nice to get us. Uh, yeah. The notes. Stats and notes to make us, uh, that helps us in our broadcast. Everything was printed off. And my favorite thing when I see the rosters from all the schools, the pronunciations, because you want to get the kids' names right. Yeah, and the school names, like yeah. Salisbury. Yeah. That helps, too. <laughs> Off the end of the bat, base hit for Ray Hill. How about this? Three for three. Showing you pretty good hitter. All three hits have been with different seals. Single to right in the first, the center in, in the fourth when he scored, and this one goes Apo in the right or the left field for the one out here in the fifth. Cam Hyder now with one away. Rahel now nine for 20 in the tournament. Try to the plate. Just missing. Try that outside corner this time. Hyder cuts through it. One and two. Doesn't have a home run this season. So outfield pretty much straight away, but shallow. Ooh. Off speed, miles per hour, we, we have to guess, but. Again, track man <laughs> took yeah. a couple of headings off. It was not a fastball. Two and two. Fights that one off. That one try uh, him his best fastball. Andrews from Hastings. Things Minnesota did pretty well in this tournament with the St. Thomas Academy. He comes 2 2. And now the count is full. Ray Hill does over there. Tries going to take a peek over, keep his eye on first base as well. I went seven in the third.
Friday against Adrian gave up four runs in the first inning one in the third it got stronger as the game went on. There he goes. Ground ball where Kulesa was standing. Had to cover the bag. So Hyder catches a break. Hit and run. Runners at the corners with one away. Again, we talk about these guys are old school coaches. Again, they call put the hit and run on, and that's how you execute a hit and run as Hyder hits the hole vacated by the second baseman. Kalesa off of the pitch. Ray Hill made it the third. And the Seagulls have something going again here in the fifth. It'll be that young man, Jacob Ferens. Signs flashed from the Gulls dugout. Jacob checks the card from the back pocket and steps in. Now he's again will play the infield back, hoping for a double play ball. No throw from Bartholomew. Hyder took off. Ray Hill did not at third. He didn't make a throw. So they concede the stolen base. Now I think the infield will come in and we will. Got to shut off that run on the plate. Now they don't have a double play option. 2-0 to Jake. <laughs> Try to the plate. Tosses a strike, two and one. No activity in either bullpen. Oh, way outside. In the other batter's box, three and one. Waddell would be next. And Waddell's hitting over 500 in the tournament. Cut by Ferens. Now the count is full. Good fastball there from the big right hander. Three two on the way. Ferens struck out. Tried to go down low and make contact. But failed in that attempt. Two away. Found you so good poise there. The ball in the dirt got up, didn't panic, knew he had to throw to first to complete the, shift, the strikeout, but made sure he looked at the runner at third before he made the throw to first. So, tries strikeouts have come at the right times. With two on in the second, he with Waddell and McCollum. Waddell the center, Lehman giving chase and makes the catch on the run. Goals lead two on. But still leading. <laughs> I haven't heard that one. You're not trying. Yeah. Goals lead 3 1, bottom five. We've been passing out the accolades. And how about for our guys, our crew here, the Tupelo Honey crew, led by Alan Hughes, the director, Alec DeFord, who's on replay. And then our camera guys, who they sweat more than us in the booth, which is nah, tough to I, do. I, I Greg Walgast, Eric Benson, Michael Kramer, and Kevin Thorne. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Awesome job. They've been here long for the ride. Early mornings, late nights. Sometimes they've gone into the next morning. Now you guys have done a great job. And just because Bob's shouting out now, don't think like track man, you can leave early. You got to be here till the end. You see right through me, don't you? Yep. Yeah. We're halfway through this one. If St. Thomas wins, there will be another game. Note the camera crew. And to, uh, if Salisbury wins, there will be a dog pile in the middle of the field, and the Seagulls will have their first ever national championship. Matthew Ink leads off the bottom of the fifth for the Tommies, trailing by a pair. But seriously, the camera crew's been great. Allen's a pro, great to work with, and You've made our stay very pleasant, and the viewers have benefited from your pretty pictures. I echo that. Two and one. 
Now, if you heard everything I said, and the only thing you took out of that was Tupelo Honey, you got to go Google that. That's that's a whole that's a whole story. Three and one to Ink, who jobs to get on. Bullpen activity starting up again for Salisbury. Ballheimer delivers a strike. And coming into the tournament, Ballheimer only threw seven and two third innings all year. Bouncing ball to second, and McAuliffe. This time it's his turn to have a bad hop. Second error for Salisbury. The but bad hops that, that we have seen in the tournament have all been on the right side. Yeah, but you got to make that play. You got to get in front of it. I mean, he all it. To, I assume they gave him an error. They did not. It's a hit. Oh. You're not an official scorer either. <laughs> well, once upon a time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Trying to get the bunt down and issues. Ferens pounces on it from behind home plate. So Morris erased one away. But you are correct about the bat hops being mostly on the right side of an infield. And again, the ground crew is tried its best to maintain a facility that's seen 14 games in five days. Top of the order and Kulesa now. Sam is one for two. Bouncing ball to short. Deep in the hole, Rice goes to second, not in time. Inc. got there in time. So the inning continues here with two aboard and one down. It's a tying run at first after the infield hit by Kalesa. Surprised that Inc. didn't slide. Rice been a nice play and made that close. And Troy Brohan says. I think we're going to review the play. Yeah, he, he came out and said. Go look at it. I'll use one of my challenges. Yeah, the fact that it didn't slide, I think, made it closer than or enough to cause our first review of the day. And it will also give Corey Burton more time to warm up. Again, to complete that thought, I started before the infield hit by Hank. Dahmer pitched sparingly coming into the tournament. He'd only thrown seven and two-thirds innings in five appearances. The other night, he went two and two-thirds, picked up the win. So he's almost thrown more here in Cedar Rapids than he has all season. So two umpires, they lead the proceedings. They go underneath into the tunnel here at Veterans Memorial Stadium. They've got headsets. They've got a monitor. They're in communication with upstairs. And then they will render their decision when they return to the field. Regardless of the outcome, Troy Brohan decided to use one of his two, so he's got one challenge remaining. And it was a quick review. Still safe at second base is Ink. So the call stands. Yesterday's game, the 6-1 victory by the Gulls. We had just one video review as well was close to and be I sure. Think we're going to see a pitching change now. Brohan walking to the mound. Again, Thalheimer's worked seven innings here in the tournament after pitching only seven and two-thirds all season. So he might have had it. Brohan has to make that decision. The freshman has thrown 61 pitches, 38 of which have been strikes. Yep, Pat on the shoulder. Called the bullpen. Nice work by the uh, freshman. Yeah, Thalheimer gave them a terrific start here in their quest for a national championship. He will exit. Get a round of applause and some love from his teammates. They lead it three to one here.
On the relief for the Seagulls, it's the junior right-hander, Corey Burton. He's from Baltimore. I've seen him twice earlier in this tournament. He threw an inning of scoreless, hitless relief with two walks against Cortland in an 11-8 victory on Sunday night. That was his last appearance. He also appeared Saturday through two innings against Wheaton, allowed three hits and a run, walked two, struck out two. So we've got to see Corey quite a bit. On the year, coming into this tournament, Burton was 3-0. Picked up three wins at the regional in high point when uh, Salisbury went unbeaten. So coming into the tournament, he's 3-0 with a 2.08 earned run average. Let's see what he is right now, the updated stats. Got a 2.16 ERA. He's walked 15, struck out 31 in 33 innings of work. He's got a save. Inherits two runners on base with one out here in the fifth. St. Thomas looking to tie. It's the tying run at first. It's the number two hole hitter in the Tommy lineup. Here is Avery Lehman. Single in the third. Takes a strike here. Hill scampers in on the grass. It's chopped up the middle and tag at second by Rice. He had thoughts of trying to turn two, but got the baseball first and then made sure he won the race for the bag. Ball was too slowly hit to get two. He wanted to make sure and get one. He thought about throwing the first, but instead he gets the force on Coessa. So runners on the corners, and this is Thorpe who with two on and a run in the third, hit the ball hard at Rice, but it turned into a double play. He flew out in the first inning. Runner goes from first, and Ferens came up throwing, lost the handle. And now a single to the outfield ties the game. Thorpe's four for 18 in the tournament with an RBI. Got a home run and 17 RBIs on the year, hitting 215. And he's hitting in the hole normally held by Jake Porter, who's injured. Nice pitch there from Burton. 0 and 2. Trying to hold the fort here, hold the lead. Thorpe was 0 for 3 yesterday. He's hitting 14 of his last 18 games, however. Fifth year senior. Barron's set up on the outside and Burton went there. Thorpe couldn't chance it. O2 belted, but foul. Thorpe jumped out in front of it. a couple times is Josh now set Burton asks Ferens to run through the signs again he's set the 0-2 one and two Ink at third Layman at second for the Tommies. And tie this game at three. Thorpe can deliver.
strike three called. Burton came inside for Frozen. And two runners stranded for the Tommies. Five complete here in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. 3-1 Seagulls. This is game two in a best of three. If it stays 3-1 or it stays on their side of the ledger, when we complete nine, then the Seagulls will be NCAA Division III National Champions. If the Tommies rally here, then we tee it up and do it all over again in a winner-take-all matchup. Start a half hour at the conclusion of this one if we play a game three. And with that, St. Thomas's days in Division Three are over. They'll be a Division One school beginning in the fall. McCulloch will kickstart the sixth for Salisbury. Then Meekins and Castor. Goes after the first pitch. Into the glove of Morris, one away. One pitch, one out here in the sixth. Cry has thrown 90 pitches up till now. No bullpen activity for Chris Olin. There is activity, a lot of stretching going on in the Seagulls bullpen. You got that bungee cord action going. Want to know to Meekins, he's been quiet today, 0 for 3, a pair of strikeouts in there. Two and 0. Kinder's count here for the All-American outfielder. And he does. Drops it in the left for a base hit. Jason Worth lookalike has his ninth hit of the tournament, now nine for 21. Not allowed to wear a monocle when you're batting. Safety hazard. Here's Kavi Castor, the left fielder. Been on base every time today. Cue ball down to third. Out at second. And that's all they'll get. Meekins a race, two down. Said that had more than a little spin on it. But Halverson corralled it and got made sure of getting one out. Kolasa decided with Castor running, there's no way to waste a throw, or no reason to waste a throw. They weren't going to get him. Two down for Cameron, the designated hitter, 0 for 3. Great jump by Castor. Bartholomew's throw, not in time. Look at 21 stolen bags now. Two today. Yeah, he hadn't been very successful here up till now in Cedar Rapids. Just one of three, but he had a big jump there. And no chance for Bartholomew to throw him out. Again, six Seagulls ranked inside the top ten in their conference, the coast-to-coast -coast in stolen bases. Castor, Rice, Heider, Meekins. Scott Cameron. A lot of them on the base pads, not afraid to just call their own number, get the green light if they see an opening. He'll take the bag. Fourth they beat Cameron's been up there with a the runner on, Castor on, and Try has handled him. Runs on that one. Cameron struck out in the first with Castor at second. He grounded to third. And the third with Castor at second. And ground back to her run out three to one in the fourth with Castor aboard. So 
We'll see what he does here with Caster again in scoring position. Two out in the sixth. He strikes out. Caster stranded again. Try. Is it the old college try? Bottom six, still time for the Tommies. Trailing three to one. They'll have to come back against the relief or the bullpen of the Seagulls, however. You mentioned it earlier, Bill. That's been their, their rally cry, their model. They've been the comeback kids. So this is nothing new for them. Only a two run deficit. Bartholomew to lead off the sixth, then Halverson and Wallace. Again, nine of their 11 postseason victories have been comebacks, two walk-offs. And we've seen it in this tournament. They beat Wash U, the number one team in the country, according to the pollsters that sent the Bears home with late inning rallies. One and one to Bartholomew walked his last time up. Been pretty quiet against Seagull pitching though. Six hits yesterday, six hits today. Pounded into the ground, Waddell steps in front and Ray Hill applies the tag. Bartholomew erased. Pulled him off. Ray Hill, big target over there, able to apply the love tap on Bartholomew. Here's Halverson. Nothing for two this afternoon. Strike from Burton. Halverson six for 20 in the tournament, 0 for two today. Out of Shoreview, Minnesota. To Tino Grace High School. You know their mascot? Tatino Grace? <laughs> no. You know, you know Anthony LaPanta, who yeah. you might have worked with once upon a yeah. time. He coaches football at Tatino Grace. Really? I text Anthony. I mean, he's an assistant coach in football because he's usually doing the wild or some twins pre and post game work. I'm just thinking it's you know it's a unique school name. And so Well, Tatino is a big contributor there. I, wa I was going to say. They didn't sell pizza rolls. That was the no, Pelucci that's, family. That's Totino's. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but no, that is, it's, anyway, they've been big contributors to, to Tino Grace High School. I'm a Twin City guy, folks. If yeah, you're that's, so. And that's why I asked yeah. him, thinking he might know that, just yeah. useless information but I've, stored I've away. I failed you with my uh, confirmation. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll look it up between it. Yeah, the Google machine will answer for us. I'm all over St. Thomas Academy and University of St. Thomas. Halverson down on strikes Stop. while we play Trivial Pursuit. Yeah. Here's Mike Wallace. Wallace made his varsity debut in the playoffs, went 7 for 14, missed the regional because of an injury, but he's been forced into the lineup because of the injury to Jake Porter, the right fielder who looked like he hurt his hamstring. It's a leg problem anyway that has kept Porter out of the lineup today. Wallace in the lineup and has reached base on an error and struck out. Burton ahead quickly, 0 and 2. Belted foul. I told you Wallace went to Minneapolis Southwest. I got no story. They were really good in hockey. Former Olympic coach Dave Peterson, he yeah. coached high school hockey. Okay. At That's Southwest High. That's a good nugget. In the air center field, Meekins has the answer. 
And the answer to our Totino Grace question is the eagle. We go to the top of the seventh inning here in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. There's your score. Seagulls creeping closer to their first ever national championship. You gonna button up the Totino strike? Other than they're the Eagles, but that, yeah, that was my that was my role. Well, the, you you take it. Well, that I was correct by gut reaction. Totino pizza rolls. Yeah, that family Rose Totino is the frozen pizza lady and a big benefactor to the school, which is located in Fridley, Minnesota, in, in the suburbs, and that's where. That young man went to school. Oh, there's a real long story. Oh, boy. Yeah. Kyle Halverson, the third baseman. Went. There's Stephen Rice to lead up the seven. They're not the, they're not the pizza rolls. It's not the school logo or no, mascot. No. They're the Eagles. Yeah. Base hit for Rice. He'll start up the seventh here for the Gulls, looking to add some more. To the scoreboard total, they lead it by two. Rice had four hits against the Tommies yesterday. They've held him in check today, but he's aboard with a leadoff single here in the seventh. Again, no activity in the Tommies bullpen. Try up to 102 pitches. Ray Hills had a day, three for three, all singles in the second, in the fourth, in the fifth. Squares fouls it off. Sky hit a home run earlier in the tournament that almost hit the scoreboard here in right center. That was last Friday. St. Thomas thinks he's going to bunt, though. Rice on first. Rice, 17 of 19 in stolen base attempts this year. He's stolen two in Cedar Rapids in two attempts. Runner goes. Sky skies it to center. Layman catches for out number one. And Ink tried to deke him as if the ball was coming up the middle and, and followed through as if he was in the throw to first. But Rice didn't buy the deke. He's a shortstop, too, he says. I've seen that play. One away for Cam Heider. Tommies have activated their bullpen. TJ Constantina started to loosen up. He's been the mainstay in St. Thomas's bullpen all season. 1-0 to Hyder. Goes the other way. Base hit. Finds some green in left center. Rice all the way to third. Runners at the corners for the Gulls with one away. And now Ferens will get a shot here with Ducks on the pond. We told you that Jacob had a web gem, to borrow a phrase, behind the plate. Watch this. It's against Portland the other night, a key moment in the game. He makes the catch and trips over the balls, <laughs> bounces off the screen, and completes a very unconventional double play. I mean, that's why when he got hit in the face, this kid is hard-nosed to begin with. He had no fear going full tilt into the netting, that screen near the dugout. You better hope he's hard-nosed after taking that shot. Yeah, literally, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ferens today. Infield again, a double play depth there with the runners on the corners. Seagull's looking to add a very important insurance run. Down and rolls at the second.
flip the second out there and throw high at first, pulled Morris off the bat. Most importantly, he scores the run. I don't, I, don't, I don't think he gets him even with a throw on the bag. No. Ference hustle and saw to that. But Ference picks up the RBI and the Seagulls lead 4 1. And the ball was hit so slowly, there's nothing Kulesa could do to well, get it to get to him sooner. I'm not sure what Chris Oline is coming out to discuss with the point umpire. He was hopeful they could turn the double play. Get out of this inning with without giving up a run. There's Chris, we've talked about counterpart coach Brohan a lot Chris pitched in the title game in 1999 for St. Thomas I think I beat one nothing that day in North Carolina Wesleyan I mean, was drafted by the Brewers pitched in their minor league system in this ball or in, in Cedar Rapids on his ballpark in this parking lot I guess but he pitched two years for the Boyd Snappers and ever since he's been the assistant coach at St. Thomas. A late steal, and he's out. Wrong throw by Bartholomew. So Farron's erased, but the Gulls added their total on the scoreboard. Middle of seven, time to start. Now the fans enjoying baseball here. They did stretch him out and they're singing along as is tradition at most ballparks. Take me out to the ball game. In all ballparks. In there? Better be. Yeah. Certainly at Cedar Rapids it is. Bottom seven. Four Getting runs on Tommy. Yeah, four runs on ten hits. Now for Salisbury and a run on six hits. That was their line yesterday. A run on six, and they're kind of stuck at the moment. And it'll be the bottom three: Eldridge, Inc., and Morris. Against Corey Burton. He's had their number so far today. Base hit up the middle. Start for the Tommies. Leadoff man aboard. Now the shortstop, Inc., two for two with a pair of singles today. He scored the lone run back in the th third for the Tommies. Inc.'s had a good tournament. Again, we told you about his heroics in the 12th inning against Wash U. He's nine for 19. The base hit gets the Gulls bullpen busy. Burton the 1 0. Scoop in the dirt from Ferens. But it's 2 0. Double barrel action in the Gulls bullpen. All those guys that were stretching are now starting to throw. Make it 3 0. Oh. Brandon Epstein is the right hander in the bullpen. That's he on the right. And 15 is Brock Kilgus. We've seen them both in this tournament. There's a strike from Burton. There's a throw over. Keep an eye on Ink from Burton. single and ink trying to move him around oh, 
Runner goes. Inc. chops it first base side. Ray Hill will take it and get the out there. Ink trying to make something happen. Starts the runner. Ink with a harmless chopper to Ray Hill. You've seen this act from St. Thomas and building that comeback kid moniker. They chipped away and came from way down against Adrian in opening day. It was 5 0 after two and a half. They get single runs in the third and fourth, three in the fifth to tie it, and one it with runs in the seventh and eighth. Number nine hitter Max Morris takes strike one. Long look in. He's ahead 0-2. That was the first day in this tournament. They trailed Wash U 5-3 in the sixth and 7-5 in the eleventh and found a way to win 8-7 in 12 innings. And then the next day, Sunday, they trailed 4-3 after eight innings, scored three in the top of the ninth and one 6 4 So they're not panicky when they're down three, but certainly they love a RBI single for Morris. Oop. Max said, pulled back, tried to check it in time, can't strike out for Burton, two away. Very defensive swing there. Tip your hat to Burton for making a good pitch. So now Eldridge out at second, hoping Kulesa can do something here with two away. up shallow right Hyder inning over seagulls Salisbury can they smell it can they feel it getting closer top of the eighth inning leading four to one Puffy clouds above perfect game field. Yeah, day one we had cloudless skies. A little haze in and out here. But again, no rain zip on the precip during this tournament and thankful for that. Ideal conditions. Well, warm conditions for these players. But, and very, very nice. Let's try for another inning. There is bullpen activity for the Toms as Cry starts the eighth having thrown 109 pitches. He's limited the Seagulls to 10 hits. Again, this team scored 11 runs in each of their three games here. They beat St. Thomas 6-1 yesterday, trying for their first ever national championship and lead 4-1 in game two of this best of three series. This is Luke Waddell, and Luke starts it off with a base hit. Kulesa was right where Waddell hit it, in the outfield grass. A good piece of hitting there. He deposits that baseball up and over his head, and here comes Chris Oleen. Pitching change forthcoming, we believe. Fourth inning, the Gulls have got the leadoff man on, and this may hasten tries departure. Constantina has been the ace of the bullpen. And he's been warm. And there goes Try. try has been a horse. Senior from Hastings, Minnesota, via St. Thomas Academy, gets the applause of the purple clad fans here. And now get the congratulations from his teammates. He's kept his team in the game. They're down three, but it's time to go to the bullpen and Constantina. Who threw two and two thirds innings of relief Sunday against Squash U. In fact, didn't allow a hit or a run. Struck out three in that appearance. And looked very much like the ace he's been. 
He threw an inning and two thirds of three hit scoreless relief on Friday night against Adrian. So this is his third appearance in the uh, College World Series. Constantina on the year, 29 innings pitches, 4 0. He's got five saves, block nine, struck out 36, and has an ERA of .62. So he's been the man. And he will try to keep the Seagulls at four runs and give his teammates a chance at yet another comeback. We've got six outs left to do it. And down by three here in the eighth. E.J. Constantina is six feet. A sophomore from Arlington Heights, Illinois, went to Buffalo Grove High. The Buffaloes? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and I don't know if they have Probably. any better factors that Probably. have a pizza roll background. Or B <laughs> BW3s didn't work. <laughs> <perhaps. Yeah. laughs> By the way, uh, we, uh, Bill and I dined with uh, some members of the Seahawks who frequented. We, were, we didn't sit at the well, table. Not, we didn't break bread with them. Yeah, well, I was going to say it. Had, we were in the same. We were in the same. Same chicken wing facility <laughs> that you can probably guess uh, last night. Where Salisbury's team has. Yeah, they had, a, they had a nice meal. They were very relaxed after winning game one. I thought you were too. <laughs> Throw down the first. <laughs> Cullif now. It's, it's bottom of the order for the Seagulls has done so much damage in the tournament. They played very well. Cullen tries to get the bunt down there. And they've really been a key to flipping that lineup card over and giving those mashers at the top of the order so many opportunities and I would think he's got a chance to be in the in the hunt for most outstanding player. They'll yeah. announce that at the end of the game, but he's got a he's got the best average of anybody else. Now Jacob DeFerry of Johns Hopkins hit 625. McCall, I'm not that good in math, but what's nine for 18 or nine for 16? He's maybe a better average than DeFerry. He's still playing. And it's a home run and five RBI. And he executes like this perfectly. Seagulls doing what they got to do to scratch out another run if possible. Sacrifice complete. Waddell down to second. Yeah, he handles the bat well. He's a good player. And it, I mean, he really does have a chance to be the most outstanding player. There's guys with uh, some eye open. Well, his buddy Waddell, right above him in the lineup, has got six RBIs. But uh, again, again, we talk about Caleb Durbin and Wash U. If he were playing here in the series, I think he's got a chance. He probably has been the individual star, but usually it comes off a team that wins. Here's Justin Meekins. Jackson Balzan's got to be in the hunt for MVP, too. He picked up two wins with a one uh, only on one run, nine hits, an opening night against Cortland. Well, only one run and five hits against St. Thomas yesterday. I would think he's got a chance to be the MVP if Salisbury wins. St. Thomas had some candidates then come back and win. Yeah, all good candidates to be sure. Left their mark here at Perfect Game Field. One and one to Meekins. Single his last AB. by Meekins. Slow the body down. Maybe you have a quick combo with your bat. And you step in. Bell dancing around at second base. Two and two to Meekins. Yeah, Try to get him in the chase. This guy is a free swinger. He does not get cheated. Yeah. 
He's alive there. Constantino. Strikeout would be optimal here. Excuse me, swing. That'll die on the grass. Meekins will take it. What is it? The corners with one away. Yeah, we talk about all his vicious swings, and then <laughs> yeah. you, can tell, you can see he's pointing to his muscle there. He knows <laughs> this is a, a fluke, but he'll take it. He couldn't have placed it any better. And the guy that swings so hard gets an infield hit. And there are runners on the corners in the eighth inning. Salisbury looking to add on. And Kasner has been a tough out today. Yeah, Kasner today, singled, walk, single. He's stolen two bases when he's on base. Looking to feast here. Outfield deep for him. No. I know. You gave his infielders the defensive plan. If Meekins takes off, I can't believe they'll try to throw through. Infield halfway up the middle, even at the bag at third. They love a double play ball, but you know this guy, Caster, would get tough to double up. He runs really well. Tina, the 2-0, make it 3-0. They're being careful with this guy because Cameron is a strikeout candidate on deck. He struck out twice today. I believe he had 10 strikeouts in the tournament. Taking all the way, 3-1. and one. Yeah, best to be careful if you're St. Thomas. Cameron struck out nine times in the tournament. He's on deck, however. Castro Tina's come back to run the count full here to Castro. And TJ obviously love a strikeout here. And it goes from first, swing and a miss. So Caster down on strikes. Big punch out there for Constantina. Because now it's two away. Went up the ladder. Constantina couldn't get at that high fastball. So now Scott Cameron. Meekins took off. Bartholomew didn't bother with a throwdown. Second and third with two away. Cameron, who's 0 for 4 today. Constantina, redshirt sophomore. In the postseason, 3 0 with a .68 ERA and has three saves and seven appearances. Strike. Cameron in the air, left field, on the track. All a good carry. Wallace reels it in, however. Side retired. Middle of eight. Four. And welcome back to Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Site of the 2021 NCAA Division III Baseball Championships. Cedar Rapids hosted this been for the first time in 2019. Of course, no baseball in 2020. 
Chapman won the event here in 2019. With no baseball, they were technically the defending champs. They were eliminated by St. Thomas. One of those rallies that the comeback kids had. That was in Collegeville. And uh, St. Thomas needs another rally. They're down with six outs to go. Part of the lineup up for St. Thomas right here. Trailing by three. Here's Lehman to try to start it. 1-0. and oh. Burton, the second pitcher to work for the Seagulls. Not in time, one and one. Lehman Thorpe and Bartholomew up for St. Thomas here in the eighth. Snag by Woodell. One away. Burton has faced the minimum number of batters since relieving. Starter Thalheimer, and he gets the leadoff man here in the eighth. Josh Thorpe the DH. Nothing in three trips for Josh today. Thorpe was silent in three trips yesterday. And field should push into the seats foul when it does. Play in foul territory. It's Ray Hill, two down. Now Bartholomew. Well, Burton has come in and thrown strikes. I'll say. 28 of his 34 pitches have been in the zone. And two quick outs here in the eighth. Ball one to the Tommy's catcher. That one low. The Two and oh. Alheimer and Burton have only walked one batter all day. Paul Zan only walked two last night or yesterday, and Dwyer didn't walk anybody. Certainly one of the keys to success, and you know the old. Major League pitcher who's the coach, Troy Brohan, preaches throw strikes. Like the message has got across. Liner off the glove of McAuliffe. Boy, he timed it perfectly and thought he had it for out number three. It just deflected off the leather. Great effort by McAuliffe. Here's how close he came to a circus catch. Bartholomew aboard, two away. Halverson, the third baseman, nothing in three trips. Eight hits now for St. Thomas. This one to center, it'll fall for a base hit. Back to back singles for the Tommies, trying to get something started late. You get the tie run of the plate in Wallace. I think it's Mike. Well, that's Jake I'm Porter. I'm going to say this is uh, going to be Porter in a pinch hitting role. So Jake Porter, who left last yesterday's game with a leg injury and was hobbling on the bench like Kyle Gibson, comes off the bench here in the eighth inning in a must-win game. Yeah, Kirk Gibson-esque, huh? Yeah, Kirk Gibson is, uh, well, he's he moving better than Kirk Gibson last <laughs> that night, but, but Porter has grabbed the bat and will hit. Until playing, he had what, one at bat yesterday? He had two at bats, so he got two hits. So he has reached base in 17 consecutive games and has a nine game hitting streak. So obviously, 
couldn't start today with the bum wheel. Yeah, you got to think his mobility has been impaired, but he can swing the bat, he told Chris Olin. He had the two-run double to tie the game in the 11th inning Saturday against Wash U. And he'd love to do the same here. Porter hitting 362 on the air with three homers, 40 RBIs. He's the best hitter in the tournament for St. Thomas. Five for 11 with five runs knocked in. First pitch up the elevator shaft. McCulloch calling, catching. No heroics for the Tommies. Might have been too impatient there. We go to the ninth in Cedar. Top of ninth, Seagulls will try to tack on some insurance runs with the Porter AB. Can't play the field, obviously, so some changes. You have Morris, the first baseman. He goes out to left field. That's where Mike Wallace was. Move Mike Wallace from left to right field. And taking over at first base is number 13. That's Owen Best. He's a freshman first baseman. Also does some catching. Still Constantine on the mound. There's a look at Best. But St. Thomas had a shot. They got Porter up there. And he jumped on the first pitch and popped up. It had all the earmarks of a Kirk Gibson moment, but Tip your hat to Corey Burton. Got out of trouble. We go to the ninth with St. Thomas down three runs to Salisbury. I'm going to correct myself. Eldridge remains in right field. That's where he started. That's where he stays. So it's just Morris for Wallace and left. And Best at first base replacing Morris. Everything's straight defensively. Here is Stephen Rice. Kickstart the top of the ninth inning. 4-1 lead for the Gulls. Two and zero. Rice today. Three straight ground outs until he singled and scored in the seventh inning. Down on strikes here, one away. Mr. Tina made him look bad with that sweeping pitch. Surprised you haven't mentioned Sammy the Seagull, your favorite mascot in the Phillies. All you you don't know Sammy personally because we've learned how the mascots traveled here, but you've liked what you've seen of Sammy on the scoreboard. Mm -hmm. Very handsome. Yeah, the scoreboard. handsome logo mascot. He looks like he's been doing steroids to be honest but he's, he's just he's in the weight room obviously he's built he's got a nasty scowl on his face he means business yeah, yeah. the Seahawk the uh, Seahawk sea dinner would have been brightened for you if Sammy the seagull was would have appeared oh. with, with the other there's Sammy that's it yeah. see he means business that's, Look at your, that. that's your favorite mascot of the tournament it is Got the Letterman sweater on, so, you know, sporting the school colors. That's important. Being an alum of St. Thomas, I have to be proud of my alma mater, but the Tiger didn't make it here either. And we discussed the Tommy. Tommy the Tiger. Nickname, yeah. 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 One two to Ray Hill off the end of the bat. Long run for Morris, who gets there. Out number two. And to be fair, Eight and, and you eight, always are. Eight teams here and 0 for 8 on the mascots well, roaming they, the stands. Again, we had a few tough times, I heard, uh, in athletic departments this year. I mean, We're we just had, happy to be playing. We had the profs <laughs> whose mascot is an owl. It's a tough, no, it's a foul ball. You can see it's a tough chance there. It, it got a piece of Hyder. Tim Hyder trying to walk it off. <laughs> Yeah, that's why the umpire take a walk out there, let 
Cam get some time. In the Tommy's half of inning number nine, seven, eight, and nine are scheduled. That's Eldridge, that's Inc., and that's Morris. We need those guys to get on base, get the top of the lineup card back to the plate to try to force a decisive game three. Two to Hyder. We saw former Yankee Scott Brocious win a national championship at the D3 level. He coached Linfield to the crown in 2012, I believe it was. All my history. Now Troy Brohan trying to do the same after pitching career with Arizona, San Francisco, and the Dodgers. Twenty thirteen. Yeah. I'm cheating though. I'm looking at the uh, media guide. Down the first base line, best. Stays with it. Constantina covers, side retired. Can the comeback kids from Minnesota do just that one more time? Speaking of awesome logos, how about the home club who's here when we're not occupying the ballpark? It's a corn cob, it's a bat. Anyway, the Cedar Rapids Colonels. We've been our hosts. Those are the American Rivers Conference. They've done a very nice job, and we thank them for, again, all they've done to put this event on over the last five days. Yeah, they've been gracious hosts here in Cedar Rapids. We appreciate them. Well, here we go. Will there or will there not be a winner-take-all game three this afternoon here in Cedar Rapids? Up to the Tommies to rally back and force the issue. Upstairs to Charlie Eldridge. Corey Burton on for his fourth inning of work. St. Thomas has collected three hits against him, but no runs. Ball two, Troy Brohan gets the ball to Burton. He'll try to let him finish this one off, but bullpen. Yeah, I think it's Epstein and Hilligus who were throwing earlier. Still up. Ferentz will not have to crash into the netting this time. It's up and over the stadium. Actually, it's Clayton Dwyer who threw four innings of one hit scoreless ball last night. That's Dwyer on the on the right. He's an All-American. Picked up a win, was a starter on, earlier in the tournament on Saturday. Strike two and two. And Clayton, second teamer in the All American squad, according to D3 Baseball by the time. Brock Hillegas is his partner in the pen. But they'll let Burton try to get these final three outs. And you know Burton wants to get this leadoff hitter. Two-two pitch. Softly to right center. Meekins. Out number one. And again, we talk a lot about the bats, but this is a good balanced team that Troy Brohan has put together. They win with their defense as well. Guys like Meekins make the plays. They cover a lot of ground. And again, they play the game right with the, the small ball. You might not like if you well, follow Major League Baseball these days, but it's a good, well, a real well balanced team with good pitching as well as the big bats and the colorful performers. Up the middle, Rice bobbles, throws, not in time. They talk about their defense, and there's an E6. It gives St. Thomas life with one out in the ninth. Rice got there, slowly hit up the middle. 
But a little bobble, trying to get it out of the glove. And so Inks aboard here with one down. There's Morris. Started out at first base. Give Ink, you, know, you did, give him credit for the hustle to make that bobble cost him. Horst's job to get on to get the tying run to the plate. To right, Hyder has to backpedal and does. Two away. So the leadoff man, Kulesa. He'll try to keep things alive for the Tommies. The Seagulls dugout. They're alive. Teams from the West have won the last four national championships. It's been a while since a team in either Texas or California that's won. The Seagulls would like to bring the trophy back out east. I mean, most importantly, they like to win for the first time in school history. Well, the guys in the bullpen, they've retreated to the dugout. We want to observe the moment. Meekins, got to play it on a hop. Ink to third. Tommy's alive on the Kulesa single, tying run to the plate. You expect nothing less from the comeback, kids. Lehman is the tying run. Not a big power threat. They've yet to hit a home run this year, but they get the tying run at the plate, and maybe they'll force Troy Brohan to, to bring in Dwyer. Those guys that came in for a better view of the yeah. last out, they're been, they've been set back at the bullpen. They're working again. Avery Lehman's the hitter. Burton just missed, 1-0. And hits now for the Tommies. Trying to string some together here in the late stages. 2-0. Tough to pitch the ninth inning at every level. Even tougher to get the last out in the College World Series. four today and 0 for 7 the last two days against Salisbury pitching. And now it's full. Runner at first, Kulesa will be off with the pitch. St. Thomas has two walk-off wins, seven other comeback wins, and 11 postseason wins this year. Ball four, they're loaded. Runs aboard for the Tommies with two away. And Tori right, Brohan to the mound very casually. And now he is signaled to the bullpen. I think this will be Dwyer. Yep. He'll go to his All American to try to get this final out. Again, Clayton Dwyer pitched last night or yesterday afternoon against uh, St. Thomas. In four innings of work, he allowed one hit, struck out four, didn't walk anybody, and didn't allow a run. So they bring Dwyer back on consecutive days. This is his third appearance in the tournament. He started on Saturday and uh, had cuffed it around pretty good by Wheaton, allowed seven hits and four runs in four innings in that start. Base 21 hitters, but uh, so he's pitching for the third time in four days. 
but he's got a chance to win the national championship for the Seagulls if he can get the last out. It will be Josh Thorpe, the designated hitter. On the year, Dwyer's All-American credentials are he's 10-0 and with a 2.19 ERA. In 78 innings, he's struck out 107 and walked about 11. Again, he won the triple crown and for pitching in the the C to C Coast to Coast Conference. Led the league in wins, ERA, and strikeouts. In fact, his 10 wins are tied for fifth nationally in Division Three. The transfer from Montgomery College, who's pitched the last two years for Brohan in uh, Salisbury, Maryland. So we've got the drama, I guess we expected whenever you watch St. Thomas play this postseason. Mm -hmm. Burton. He came on with one out in the fifth inning. What a job he did. Leaves with two outs here in the ninth inning. Didn't give up a run. But as we mentioned during his stint, he threw strikes, leaned on his defense. He got the outs that they needed. Now his team needs one more out. This is Josh Thorpe, the fifth-year senior out of Plymouth, Minnesota, and Robbinsdale, or excuse me, on Armstrong High School. Mentioned Thorpe today, 0 for 4. A chance to play hero here with two outs. Caster respecting the right hand that hitting Thorpe in left. Meekins is short, shallow in center field, and so is Hyder in right. Dwyer trying to make quick work. 0-2. Thorpe is hitting 14 of his last 18 games, but Salisbury's pitching has had him figured out. And they put their Dwyer quickly ahead 0-2 on the count here. Three. Bouncing ball to short. Rice bobbles. Bases stay loaded. A run in. It's 4-2. And it's tough to get that last out, no matter whether you're on the mound or in the field. Second air of the inning for Rice. This is going to be a tough chance, but I think he's going to have a chance to throw out Thorpe. We'll never know as he bobbled it. So St. Thomas has the tying run at second, the winning run at first. This is Charlie Bartholomew, the cleanup hitter. Ball one to Bartholomew. One for four in the day. Seven for 19 in the tournament with an RBI. Dwyer goes inside, 2-0. and oh. Had 18 hits in his last 15 games. Just one for six against Salisbury in this series. We wondered when the inning began, would there be drama? Answer, welcome to the drama. To left, Caster. Catches, goals, get it! And birds of a feather dogpile together. Well, as they have the whole postseason, St. Thomas gave their fans and their bench a thrill. That ball was well hit by Bartholomew to the opposite field, but Caster got over, made the play with the bases loaded. St. Thomas ends up just short, they, they strand 11, and the Seagulls from Salisbury win their first ever national championship with a 4-2 win, take the series 2-0,
and congratulations to Troy Brohan and a very well-balanced team. The All-American pitcher Clayton Dwyer got the last out and the Seagulls have the much coveted national championship. That trophy, that hardware, it's been lurking here in Cedar Rapids. They tuck it away, they, they keep it away so no one can get a sneak peek of the prize of the eight teams that make, that make their way here to Cedar Rapids. And then those Seagulls, they couldn't grab hold of it soon enough when they got that final out. And now they have t-shirts as well. It says national champions. And I think that means as much to them as anything. They've been here before. Again, Coach Brohan got here in his first season. Talked about building a culture as a lot of guys do, but he's put together a good team and they finally have the trophy and the t-shirts to prove it. Again, they got the All-American Dwyer. Brohan had two wins in this tournament. Again, they got input from their eight, nine hole hitters and the best probably offensive games or series at all. McAuliffe and Waddell, two of the top hitters in the tournament average-wise. Meekins, this guy gets on base and hits with great power at the start. Caster had a big series. They got a well-balanced club, as, as I say. They played defense well. Rice's two ninth inning errors notwithstanding. And uh, I, I think you got to say they were the best team here. They certainly hit it, scoring 11 runs in each of the three Pool B games and winning against two against Cortland and one against Wheaton. And then this is more of a button-down series against St. Thomas, winning today 4-2. to two. So good to see the end results here in Iowa. Good to have baseball back in the field. Good to have fans back in the stands. Great that these guys don't have to hug each other to celebrate a national championship from six feet away. Salisbury is 34 and four as they pose for pictures as the national champs. St. Thomas completes their final game as a division three school. They finish 37 and 10 and certainly will be mem remembered as the comeback kids for their ability in the postseason to make it dramatic. They fall two runs short today. The final line, the Salisbury Seagulls. Four runs on 12 hits. They had three errors but danced around them. For the Tommies of St. Thomas, two runs on 10 hits and no errors. Partner, it's been fun. It always is with you, and you did a nice job. Thank you. For Bill Brophy and our entire terrific crew, the Tupelo Honey Crew, Bob Raynard saying so long from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Once again, the final score. We button up and close out the NCAA Division III Baseball Championship with the winners from Maryland, the Salisbury Seagulls. They win it over St. Thomas 4-2. Stay tuned on NCAA.com for the award ceremony.
Ladies and gentlemen, have a safe trip home, and we'll see you again next year here in Seattle.